This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. From MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts. It's the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. With today's high gasoline prices and even higher temperatures, some people are finding it practical to forego road trips and stay at home to explore the wealth of flora and fauna right here in our own backyards. So today we welcome back Joe McGee to talk about his recent backyard observations and what you might see as our local critters deal with this extreme summer heat. And as always, we want to hear from you about what you're seeing in your area. Join our conversation this morning with your phone call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring it's one 672 7464 You can send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. If you ever miss part of the Thursday broadcast of Creature Comforts, it repeats Saturday mornings at 6. So good morning, Libby. You're still out west in Oregon. Tell us what you're seeing out there on the west coast. Good morning. Yes, I am still in Oregon. We're uh, preparing to go Dungeness, Dungeness crabbing this morning. Oh, wow. And uh, over to Ballport Bay, and so that's kind of what we're thinking about right now is things we'll see on the coast. We'll see harbor seals and um, all the coastal birds, and um, it's uh, something we like to do when we're out here. And uh, the Dungeness crabs are the great big crabs, bigger than blue crabs by a long shot, although we've had that discussion about what tastes the best, and we still think blue crabs do. But uh, this is what's available here, so uh, we'll uh, spend probably a half a day or so in a boat in the bay and um, with um, big crab traps. So h- how does that work then? You kind of throw the crab trap out and then wait to s- till the crabs go in it? <laughs> yeah, it sort of actually it kind of looks like um, it could be a, a kind of a wire mesh cat carrier box, you know, because uh, it's a pretty big trap, I guess, I don't know, 24, 36 inch square almost, and uh, you put a little chicken in there and throw over, let's see, I can't remember now with our, you know, we, it's a licensed fishing, so um, we have our Oregon State, out of stater licenses, and uh, you throw your traps over. They're tied, of course, to your boat or to a, a, a buoy. We'll we'll just let ours float in kind of a, a constellation there, you know, six or eight traps. And um, really, by the time you put them all out and get it set and turn back around um, in the boat, and you can usually start picking them up and sorting through the crabs. And usually more than half of our catch we let go real quick because we we can only keep males that are um, big enough. Uh, they're almost six inch. I think it's five and seven eighths or five and three eighths, but we have or five and three four something. Anyway, we have a little measure that the um, Department of Wildlife gives you, and you just hold it to a certain spot on each of your crabs, and it's easy to tell what needs to go back overboard. But um, you know we'll. We want crabs hard enough that we don't get to notice everything else is around. Oh, and I guess one interesting fact, because at home we always crab with fish, you know, to catch blue crab. And here we don't use fish because the harbor is full of seals, and they come out and follow your boat anyway, which is a lot of fun. We don't feed them. But we get to watch them. Uh, and, of course, they do want you to feed them. And uh, if you bait your traps with fish, they um, immediately rob that that bait, but they don't like chicken, so it's okay to to use chicken, and they'll they'll just follow along, and um, still big just because you know they're seals. But anyway, it's a lot of fun, and uh, the grandkids will be with us, so they'll enjoy watching seals and birds probably as much as they will catching crabs. Mm-hmm. 
Now, long-time listeners to the show <clears throat> might remember that I used to reference Gilligan's Island quite frequently, and I haven't done it in a long time, but Libby, oh, your, yeah. your story makes me remember one episode where <clears throat> the professor thought the island was sinking, and so the men in the island, not wanting to upset the women at night, were trying to build structures and this sort of thing, and they tried to build a boat, and nothing worked, nothing worked. Well, it turns out that Gilligan was using the stick the professor was using to measure the water level on the island to cap to for crabbing and he kept moving the stick deeper out into the lagoon to catch bigger crabs so the island was not sinking it was gilligan using the professor's <laughs> marker uh as a uh, to uh, to help him out crabbing so uh, you know if you, if you can't relate something to i will say either seinfeld or gilligan's island that's that's what i try to do anyway <laughs> so yeah yeah we hope we don't go. On, how, what was it? The six-hour tour? Yeah, three-hour tour, well, right? <laughs> three-hour tour. Yeah. Well, we hope our three-hour tour is about a three-hour tour. Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. You wanted to mention something that's taking place at the Clinton Nature Center. Uh, yes. Yes. This is International Moth Week, and so Friday. Uh, let's see. What's Friday? July the twenty-fifth. I mean, twenty-ninth. So that's tomorrow night, the twenty-ninth of. July at eight o'clock, they're celebrating Moth Night with um, a night to come and watch moths, or watch a moth night. So, um, if you live in the Clinton area, you know anywhere close to Jackson, you might want to do that at eight o'clock tomorrow night, or you might want to celebrate on your own, even um, you know tonight. The the week, of course, started I guess July the twenty fourth through the thirtieth. But um, because every year it's the last full week of July, I believe. But moths are an awfully fun thing to watch in the summer. And I confess I've not been watching moths out here, partly because it gets late. I mean, it gets dark so late in the evening that, um, you know, it's about at least 10 o'clock before I can start catching moths. Although I have done that many times in Mississippi, so I guess I'm going to need to stay up a couple of three nights a little bit later. And um, you put out a you can put out a sheet and lights if you want to use a black light. You'll catch more moths or attract more moths. Um, what we do is just go out and look at what's um, around the lights and not try to catch them. Usually, if we're with a entomologist that wants to collect moths, then we will. You know, we will take what we, what they want, but it's just fun to see what you have on your porch or anywhere around a, a light at night. You know, it's interesting when we look at fireflies. The whole thing was we wanted it to be as dark as possible so we could see the fireflies. But with these moths, you obviously want a light source because it it attracts the moths. Is that right? That's right. Yes, that is the opposite of what I'm used to, and I. I say a lot about cutting off lights at night, and so you don't create light pollution that confuses insects. But with the moths, you do trick them a little in that you do put out a light and attract them. So I, you don't have to use a lot of light, though, so I won't, I won't cause too much problem. Oh, and uh, Joe had a good moth sighting. He saw a really pretty silk moth that he sent me a photograph of. I think you got one, too. You might want to ask him more about his moths. We will do that, indeed. Joe, you're on the line with us. Tell us about your experience with moths. Okay. Uh, earlier this week, I was sitting at my desk, uh, which faces a window, and a large silk moth, one of our large silk moths, flew up to the window, and I immediately dropped everything I was doing and went outside, but I couldn't find it. It was just it disappeared. The next morning, I assume it the same moth was there, I found it, and it's one called a um, sweet bay silk moth. Uh, the host plant for the caterpillar is uh, our sweet bay magnolia, which many people have in their yards. Uh, it's supposedly a fairly common silk moth, but you know none of them are really all that common. I don't see one every day of the week. Uh, this is a beautiful one, and uh, if you want to post the photograph I sent you uh, on the uh, podcast, that would be fine with me. I think everyone who sees it would agree it's a beautiful moth, and I, you know, I, it's worth dropping everything you're doing to to uh, go look at a, a silk moth and try to photograph it. Yeah, we will add that. To our producer job will add that picture to uh, the description for the podcast for this episode. Uh, this is Creature Comforts. Time for our first break of the hour. When we get back, we'll be 
continue to talk with our guest biologist, Joe McGee, about his backyard observations. Uh, if you have a question or a comment, if you want to join the conversation this morning, give us a phone call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring Our phone number is one 672 7464 You can email animals at mpbonline.org. Back with more, so stay tuned. Hey, this is Larry Morrissey with the Mississippi Arts Commission. I'm one of the hosts of the Mississippi Arts Hour, the arts interview show on Think Radio. Each week, myself or one of my fellow hosts bring you in-depth interviews with different creative Mississippians. We talk with visual artists, musicians, writers, as well as people who help bring the arts to their communities. We hear about how each artist learned their craft and get some insight into their creative process. You can hear the Arts Hour every Sunday at 5 p.m. on Think Radio, or listen anytime by subscribing to the show through your favorite podcasting app. We're back on Creature Comforts. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest for the day, naturalist Joe McGee. If you'd like to join our conversation this morning with your question or comment, the number to call is one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one 672 7464 Send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. Must be a busy day at the clinic. Dr. Major has yet to join us. If he does later in the hour, we'll take your pet questions. Uh, but uh, as you can tell when he calls in a lot and hears barking in the background, it's always busy day at the clinic. So we always appreciate when he can join in, but we might need to hold off those pet questions for a future episode. We've got some callers to get to. Well, so let's begin in Wilkerson County with Larry. Good morning, Larry. You're on the air with us. Good morning. How y'all doing? Good. What do you have for us today? Yes, I was listening. You all was talking about malls. Right. Right. Well, you know, my grandfather was a medicine man. He was Choctaw and Cherokee, and I kind of follow his footsteps. I practice the Native American medicine ways and shamanism, and we use malls for different things. Uh, like uh, taking sickness away. Uh, we use, uh, the, because the concept of a moth eat, eat stuff, so we call upon the spirit of the moth to eat that sickness away. Hmm. We use different uh, things like that, like butterfly, butterflies for change. And so I'd like for y'all to kind of speak on that if you have some knowledge about it. All right, uh, Larry, uh, thanks for calling. Uh, Libby, Joe, have, have you ever heard of um, moths in, uh, in Native American uh, culture? I have I, not, and obviously I need to do some reading. Yeah, I, neither have I. I'm sadly ignorant of that. I, I, uh, I need to know more. But as Libby says, I need to do some more reading or talk to uh, someone and get a firsthand account. I don't know. I must say I don't know anything about it, but it sounds very interesting, very intriguing. All right, Larry, thanks for the call. Good. That uh, always good one to can spur some uh, thought and some research. So, um, Libby, if, if you if you find anything, please let us know uh, next week. But uh, thanks, Larry, for the call. We've got some open phone lines. If you want to join in our conversation on Creature Comforts, it's one eight seven seven mpb ring It's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. You can email animals at mpbonline.org. So, Joe, always good to have you on the air with us. Uh, tell us, what have you been seeing around your area recently? Okay. Uh, as Libby was mentioning, or I believe you brought it up, that we like to keep our yards as dark as possible to benefit the fireflies. But, uh, And I don't have any exterior lighting, or very little. I, I have a carport light, obviously, and a, and a lamppost, but I, they are off most of the time. I actually got in the habit of leaving them off because I don't like a lot of... Uh, really common insects just all, you know, getting in the house and being everywhere. But nevertheless, I have lights on inside at night. And for the past two or three summers, I've had two very large beetles visit me, and they show up in the house. Hmm. That's how I find them. And I have two cats, and one, one of my cats has occasionally found these large beetles and uh, is very curious about what they are. But anyway, I think they get in through the chimney. That's the only way I can figure that these huge beetles get in. One of them is called a, a triceratops beetle, and the other one is called a um, an ox beetle. And I have photographs of those. If you'd like to see those, I could send those to you. These are these are very noticeable. If you, the, the ox beetle is almost two inches long. It's one, about one and three-quarters inch long. That's, that's big for an insect, for a beetle. 
And the Triceratops beetle has three three horns, the way it, you know the uh, dino, the Triceratops dinosaur has. So that's something that's very interesting that I get every summer now for the past um, three years, I believe. Joe, you know, we appreciate your knowledge that you share with us, but also you take some excellent photographs. Maybe if you could give a, a tip or two when you're trying to photograph something, you know, like an insect, a, a beetle like that, that's that's kind of small. Do you have any tips for how someone might get a good picture? Well, I came to photography very, very late in life, but and I, I, I must confess I couldn't do it if I had to use film. It, the digital cameras really open up the world of photography for people like me who are uh, all thumbs or just, you know, not real tech savvy. But with with insects, uh, the large ones are not too difficult to photograph. Uh, I try to photograph them where I find them, but if it's something that's, that will, you know, fly away or move away, I catch it and put it in something that will give it a nice background. And uh, I use a macro setting on my camera, and I take – a bunch of pictures, and if I take enough, a few of them will turn out really good, or, mm-hmm. or good, I should say, I, that I'm you know, proud, willing to show people, willing to share with you. Uh, but it's, I don't have any tricks up my sleeve for that. Uh, if you're taking I have difficulty taking pictures of spiders and webs. The background, you, I have to position myself so the background is the empty sky. If there's a background behind the spider web, the, my camera picks up the... Uh, the background instead mm-hmm. of the spider. The spider in the photograph comes out very blurry, which is not good. So you have to choose the background carefully. And if the background, I was mentioning placing, a, say, a beetle that I find, these ox beetles or the triceratops beetle, uh, you know, in a box or something so I can photograph it. If if I use a really light background, white, there's too much reflection even if I'm not using a flash. Now, I don't often use a flash. Sometimes I do, but I don't often use a flash. And so uh, it, that will make the picture overexposed. There's lots of tr- – I mean, I'm just learning about – I'm sure there are photographers out there laughing at me. But uh, <laughs> I'm just learning about uh, the tricks that you have to do to, to get a good photograph. Yeah, my one tip <clears throat> would be don't be afraid to take, you know, uh, many, many shots of the same thing. That way you can have them in your camera or whatever and then go back and review them. But – snap off a bunch of them there uh, to try to yes. get the real good one. That's exactly right. And with the, that's what makes digital photography so practical for, for us beginners because you can delete all the ones that are no good that you don't want. It's just really, really nice. So, Joe, you had a question that you wanted to pose to listeners who might have a swimming pool in their backyard. Yes. Uh, over the years, and when I was you know, with the museum, I would get uh, – questions or comments about things, by things I mean critters, showing up in or at the swimming pool. And uh, usually it's a frog or even a snake. You know, things wander in, they're looking for water and they blunder into the swimming pool. And I was just wondering if anyone uh, listening has had a similar experience. I, I had a very interesting, uh, no, I don't have a swimming pool, but I, had a, I have a brother who does have a swimming pool up at Starkville. And he emailed me a photograph he took, oh, two or three weeks ago of this, what he considered a strange-looking bird hanging around the edge of his swimming pool. The, the photograph, actually, it was pretty good. It was a good photograph, but it was taken through glass, so that always you know, interferes with uh, the quality of the photograph. But I was pretty sure that that bird was a yellow-crowned night heron. And they do hang around you know, ponds and bodies of water looking for tadpoles and frogs and other things to eat. So you never know what may show up at a swimming pool if you indeed have a swimming pool, and I'd be interested to hear from folks uh, what they may have besides besides kids, the neighborhood kids <laughs> in the swimming pool. This is Creature Comforts. We've got some open phone lines if you want to join in on our conversation this morning. If you have a question for our guest, Joe McGee, or if you'd like to share some recent observations you've had of things in and around your area, give us a call. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring Our phone number is one eight seven seven. 672-7464. You can send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. So, Joe, I think in Mississippi we're used to hot summers, but this one I think most of us would agree has been especially hot. How does that affect the critters that you see in and around your area? It's probably good for the uh, insects. Your insects seem to like hot weather and high humidity, but our furry critters 
they sometimes have trouble with it. And uh, something that I had noticed over the years was squirrel, gray squirrels, our eastern gray squirrels, engaging in a behavior, and I didn't have a name for it. They, they lie down on a tree branch, or a shady tree branch, or on pavement that's in the shade. It's a little bit cooler than the air, and they just flatten their body out against the surface, this tree, tr- tree uh, branch or, or pavement, and to cool off, apparently. Squirrels are unable to sweat. You know, quite a few, and Dr. Major could shed a lot of light on this, but many mammals cannot sweat. I know hogs can, pigs cannot sweat, hogs. Uh, cows don't sweat. Horses sweat, humans sweat, but squirrels don't sweat, apparently. No sweat glands. So they need to cool off when we have this extreme weather, and they flatten their body out against a cool, slightly cooler surface uh, in hopes that, you know, heat will be transferred, the excess heat will be transferred to this cooler surface. I didn't have a name for this phenomenon until two or three weeks ago. I just didn't know what to call it. And I got an email from Tom Mann at the museum, and he had observed this among squirrels and also chipmunks. And the, uh, the uh, email he sent me had a link to a story in Texas about squirrels splooting, S-P-L-O-T-I-N-G, splooting. And uh, it's a way that they, they cool down in this extremely hot weather. And I'll bet some of our listeners have observed this and, like me, probably didn't have a name for it. So, <clears throat> uh, Libby, what about splooting? Have you seen any splooting out there uh, in Oregon? I have not noticed anybody splooting or any animals polluting in Oregon other than in uh, maybe grandchildren in the swimming pool. Uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, I think we all like to float either back down or stomach down in the in the cold water when we're hot. But I, I remember um, seeing a good many chipmunks doing a similar thing in our yard, and I used to call it shade bathing because... <laughs> You know, it was obvious they were getting somewhere cool and spreading out and relaxing, and uh, it's kind of the opposite of what they of what you would do when you're sunbathing. So I called it shade bathing, but uh, fluting. I'm not sure who came up with that name, but that works for me too. I guess if I'll have to start calling it that, if that's what's going to be the term. Actually, I did a quick uh, Google search and found this article that says the term first became popular with social media describing corgi puppies and how they would lay down on the floor with their front paws stretched forward and their hind legs stretched back behind their body. As far as most guesses go, it was named sploot to describe how they laid as a splat, and it was cute. So a splat plus cute Uh equals sploot. All right. (laughs) And I think for most of our listeners, um, like you say, you observed it with dogs. They lay out flat and their hind legs are sometimes kind of open a little bit because they're really just trying to cool off. But if you see the pictures of the chipmunks and the squirrels, it's it's something to see. <laughs> yeah. And uh, my cat does that, I think, as well. You know, I, he it looks very comfortable from what I can tell of, of the pictures I've seen. Uh, not only does it, uh, you know, help with the heat, but I think it uh, it looks like it's a comfortable way to to try to beat the heat in this uh, in, in, in the summertime. Um, so, Joe, what is it again? The, the just the surface area of their body being, as you were saying, sort of transferring that heat to to a cooler surface. I think so. It's uh, you know they're they're lying on their stomach or their you know their what we call a ventral area, the ventral surface of a of an, an animal. The back of an animal is the dorsal surface, and the underside is the ventral surface, their belly surface, and they just press it against a slightly cooler surface uh, they're smart they figure out what's a little bit cooler and uh, it, it supposedly transfers a little bit of the heat away from their body uh, when i was growing up dogs would seek out moist soil in a shady place and actually dig a dig a uh, a depression and lie in that you know our dogs had had long fur mm-hmm. but uh, nowadays i guess they've moved upscale and they're spooting <laughs> They've discovered a better way, so everyone is splooting. So maybe that will catch on. Is that? Uh, let's see. I wonder. 
uh, I guess as humans, we could do it too. I'm not sure how comfortable it would be for us, though. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if this term is actually going to be, become an official term in biology textbooks or in zoology <laughs> textbooks, but maybe it will. You never know. That's true. <clears throat> this is Creature Comforts. Time for another break. When we get back, we'll continue talking with our guest, Joe McGee. We'll talk about some of the birds he's seeing and providing water for our feathery friends. Don't hesitate to call with your own summertime observations. The number is one eight seven seven mpb ring our phone number is one 672 7464 You can send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. We've got Fletch on the line, and we'll get to his call after this. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Fix It 101 is a fun podcast with lots of home improvement information. Even if that's not your bag, all of the episodes are archived online. So if the mood strikes you or if the need motivates you, you can search your project. And yes, there is a Fix It 101 podcast for that. Kevin Farrell here with Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science, and our guest for the hour, biologist Joe McGee. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. If you missed any of today's show, you can always subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcasting app or download the MPB Public Media app. That way you can get access to all the local MPB Think Radio programs on your schedule. Got some open phone lines if you want to join our conversation this morning. The phone number is one 877 MPB ring. It's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Email animals at mpbonline dot org. As promised, we're going to go back to the phone lines. Fletch is on the line. Good morning, Fletch. What do you have for us today? Good morning. Uh, a couple of uh, wildlife sightings and then a question. Okay. Um, this morning, our Yorkie treed a possum, a little small possum, probably size of a. Um, um, soft drink it was in the backyard and luckily got the dog back inside so the possum could skedaddle um, last week was blessed to be able to go to Florida, mm-hmm. and last several years this high rise has a nest evidently on top of about a half a dozen osprey oh, wow. um, but uh, we were entertained throughout the week uh, by the osprey and the brown pelicans, but the osprey would uh, take their fish that they caught and kind of, for some reason, kind of circularly uh, edge up the side of the building. Uh, but we could see them from the balcony pretty close uh, with their fish in the talons, almost showing it off, I guess, as they took it up <laughs> themselves or their, their young. Uh, but we've been able to enjoy that in the last couple of summers. Um, my question is, is it feasible in the Metro Jackson area to make a habitat for uh, a mosquito-eating um, animal? Joe, any thoughts on that? I have thoughts. I, it would, uh, the results would probably be mixed. Uh, the first thing I think of that eats mosquitoes when he, when he said that are dragonflies. Mm-hmm. But dragonflies, you know, spend their first part of their life in water, the same habitat that mosquitoes spend their initial uh, life in, you know, the first part of their life in. So you'd be raising a mosquito control agent and also mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. Although mosquitoes seem to prefer small um, bodies of water, if you will, tires, you know, old tires that have a little bit of water in them or a tin can or something uh, but mosquito uh, dragonflies will eat mosquitoes, the, fun, you know, the adult mosquitoes. That's one way. Uh, there are birds but, that eat mosquitoes, but you can't. I don't think you could create a habitat in Jackson just for the birds, you know, the flycatchers that uh, eat mosquitoes. But it would be worthwhile to have habitat for any and all birds, and maybe some flycatchers uh, would would hang around your yard, maybe nest in the yard. There are several you know, eastern wood peewees nest in the yard. Uh, will nest in your yard. I've seen them catch mosquitoes and horse flies. Uh, Libby may have some ideas on that. I can't think of a uh, of a sure way to encourage a predator of mosquitoes except uh, dragonflies and damselflies. Libby, any thoughts? Yeah, and I guess the other thing to think about is anytime you have a body of water that you you know you that you want to keep in that area 
uh, it needs to have something in it that does eat uh, mosquitoes. And if you think about, Joe, the other, I mean, when mosquitoes are likely to be eaten the most is when they are larvae. So when they're in the water, so you want something in that water that's going to be eating the mosquito larva before they emerge, and that's usually small fish. So if you've got a food chain going in a body of water, you're much less troubled by the mosquitoes emerging than if you've got just a little standing pool of water, like something that's caught rainwater and has lingered. Toys are just really bad about uh, raising mosquitoes in a yard because they get a little bit of water in them and then the mosquitoes lay eggs in there and there's nothing to eat, the larva mosquito. So it, um, I guess that's kind of the rule of thumb is if you've got some life, got a food chain going on in a body of water, then you're less likely to be troubled by a lot of mosquitoes from that body yeah, of water. I, yeah, I'm I'm glad you mentioned that, Lydia, because there is a little fish called a mosquito fish, which would probably yeah. help uh, uh, eat the yeah. mosquito larva. Yeah, I, you know, I prefer people to uh, use native species, and uh, a mosquito fish is native to a lot of places in Mississippi, so we could um, that would be one that would work. But I think just little brim and things like that also eat mosquito larva. Right. I'm not sure that the dragonfly nymphs, you know, the immature dragonflies, eat mosquito larvae. They tend to live in on the bottom. Some of them may, but uh, I don't think you'd control the immature mosquitoes, the mosquito larvae uh, with uh, dragonflies. But, yeah, with this, that's a good yeah. idea, the, the uh, yeah. m- mosquito fish or some I kind know of little fish. Our, yeah, we've got a pond in our yard with, you know, that have, have fish and then turtles and all kinds of stuff. So tadpoles. Of course, they're vegetarian, so I don't think a tadpole is going to help you with that. But um, they're, the mosquitoes are no worse by our pond than they are in other parts of the property. And actually, sometimes they're less troublesome by the pond than they are in other parts of the property. So I figure we've got a healthy food chain in there that's eating mosquitoes. That's kind of how I like to think about it. Yeah. It seems like the smaller the body of water, the more mosquitoes you'll have in it. Yes. Yeah. I, I, you have to be real careful with bird baths because we want to put water out for our birds right now, but you um, you need to change that water out, you know, by just shooting the hose in it or something. Yeah, I try to change mine every day uh, for cool, fresh water because I see the birds coming to it, and I, I want it to be a little bit cool for them, so I change my bird bath every day. Yeah, and as Troy said last week, um, uh, pets certainly prefer fresh water to stale water, so I'm sure birds are that way too. So give them some fresh water every day. Right. All right, uh, Fletch, we appreciate your call this morning. Libby, we had someone left a message uh, in, and asking about the temperatures out there, and I think we've spoken before that it, it's it's hot, not quite Mississippi hot, but you're not escaping the heat out there completely. <laughs> no, we're not escaping the heat completely. Uh in fact, you know, we've had, oh gosh, 100 plus, wow. several hundred plus days out here. But the difference is that that's only for a few hours, like from maybe 2 o'clock to 7 o'clock at night, it will be that hot. And then it, it cools off. So when I got up this morning, it, it was 60 degrees. It's 60 degrees now. I've got on the sweater. Uh, sitting on the patio but uh it'll i know it's going to warm up today now interestingly enough the coast is always cooler it's usually cloudier and cooler than inland in the summer so we'll go to cooler weather it'll probably won't get above the 60s on the coast, plus the the um, you know, and the boat will be running, so we'll need a sleeve on the boat. Mm-hmm. But that's that's certainly the fun part to me is that I can go either direction from the little valley we're in. I can go to the mountains one direction, or go to the coast. And when I when I head west, I go through the coastal range and then to the coast. And there's always a cool breeze over there, and usually a little bit of cloud cover. Got another caller on the line, so we say good morning to Johanna calling in from Jackson. 
Hello, you're on the air with us. Go ahead. Hey, thank you. Thank you for taking my call. I had two things. Back in 2015, I was in my backyard over here in Fondren, and there must have been a hundred fireflies. It was like magic. It was so beautiful. And the other thing that I've had every year, I've got um, May Pops or Passion Flower Vines. I had what I call my Halloween caterpillars. They were orange and black, and they would just be covered. Okay, in the last several years, there's been like maybe 10 or 15 fireflies in the backyard, and the guff fillery, I think they're guff fillery butterfly caterpillars. There's been maybe none or two or something like that. I haven't changed my yard. I don't use insecticides. I've tried to do what I think is beneficial for fireflies, and I, I still have the uh, passion flower vines. So what has happened to my fireflies and my butterflies? Okay, first the gulf fritillaries that love the passion flower and oh i'm so sorry if you've lost them it of course it could be something that happened on property not yours um uh you know i would say keep looking for them but you didn't have the fireflies this year either that's a problem yeah um i'm sorry and i can't think of an exact reason and maybe pull joe in on that too um I hope you get them both back because I, I yeah. love Maypots too. We have them along a fence row, and I can always reliably found Gulf Fritillary. Um, I, I have an idea on her butterflies. You remember la- last year we had the ice storm? Mm-hmm. It's really cold. And actually, the, the, uh, the Gulf Fritillaries are a tropical species. They don't overwinter anyway, even in our mild winters uh, in Jackson or you know this far north. They have to come in from the south every year. Like, I have not seen one this year. I have them most years, and I expect to see one any day now. They could be out, or one or two could be out there. I could have just missed them. But that cold, um, uh, freezing rain that we had could have really knocked them back, you know, even further south perhaps than usual. I, I, I don't remember when she said she stopped seeing them. Over the years, their numbers have just kept decreasing. And like I said, could it be the mosquito spray? Are mosquitoes, which is more susceptible to mosquito spray, mosquitoes or fireflies or butterflies? Oh, fireflies. Fireflies and butterflies are going to be more likely to be killed by the mosquito spray than the mosquitoes, unfortunately. Well, the neighbors um, had a company that came in and sprayed their yard, and then the people across the street did, and then the city sprayed. And I'm wondering if that's maybe not the culprit. Is there anything you can do about that? Um, you can talk to the city, I think, about spraying close to your your property. But, yeah, that that's, that's a big problem. And what you're seeing in your yard is reflected in the, um, the research that we see, is particularly citizen science studies, where people like you give information in, and birds and insects of... Um, all the kinds that we enjoy seeing, I guess I'll have to say, are uh, certainly decreasing in number almost every year. Did Did you look for fireflies in, say, late April and May? Yeah, it used to. In May was when I remember seeing them the first time. They were so abundant. And I've yes. gone out there, and like I said, the numbers have just decreased and decreased. And I think the reason I had so many is I had a huge compost pile, which I never really used, but I just kept composting. It had a lot of leaves and limbs and sticks, and I'd probably leave it natural for the birds, lizards, bats, whatever. It's going to have a naturalistic yard. So I think that's why I had this. It was like a bloom. There were so many. It was just amazing. Yes. And it was yeah, in May that yeah. I saw them. Yeah. And now the other several part- species, too, at that time. Yeah, are there new lights in the neighborhood or in your yard at night? That makes a difference. If you if you have those lights on, you they... um. I'm Their sorry, numbers will say? decrease through the years if you have increase in light. Won't just wipe out a population usually when you get new yard lights, but it can um, decrease the population through the year. Through Can the I years. say something else about the lights? Uh, we were talking about using lights to attract moths, but there are day flying moths. We can. There are some beautiful moths that are out in the daytime, and some really. Uh, Late in the day, those are, we sometimes call them crepuscular. They show up around dusk. And if you have the right plants in your yard, uh, they frequent those. You may have heard of the hummingbird moth or the hummingbird clearwing, I think the books call it now, or the bumblebee clearwing. 
those will come to Lantana. So it's not absolutely necessary to have lights for uh, for miles, uh, and you'd probably do it infrequently anyway. And that way you can have miles and fireflies. If, right. if lights are in fact the problem, you know, or, or, or is the thing that's discouraging your uh, your fireflies. Johanna, thanks for the call. Hopefully, things uh, you know this might be a, a season where you don't get a lot. Maybe uh, in the coming years it'll it'll change. But thanks for calling up. Got a couple of ideas there. What might have caused that? Uh, we need to take our last break for the hour. When we get back, we'll wrap things up with our guest Joe McGee. We still have time for you to call in as well. The phone number is one eight seven seven MPB ring. Our phone number is one eight seven seven. 672-7464. You can send an email to animals at mpbonline.org. We'll get to Rachel's call after this last break. Hi, I'm Dr. Jimmy Stewart, professor of internal medicine and pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. On the original Southern Remedy, we answer questions about all aspects of your health and share some of the latest medical information in the news. You can listen to the show on Wednesdays at 11 on MPB Think Radio, or you can subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy on your preferred podcasting app. We're back to wrap things up on Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. I'm Kevin Farrell, here with Libby Hartfield, and our guest for today, biologist Joe McGee. Still time to join our conversation with a phone call, if you're quick, one 877 MPB ring is the number. It's one eight seven seven six seven two seven four six four. Rachel is up next on the phone lines. Uh, good morning, Rachel. Thanks for calling. Okay. Good morning. So uh, I've been hoping and wishing I'd, uh, to hear a program about owls. I'm just fascinated with owls. Halloween's coming up. Maybe <laughs> that would be a good time to to do uh, a program about owls. Joe, go ahead, Libby. Yeah, I was just going to say, great suggestion. I'll I'll look for somebody in the next few weeks that will come on and talk about owls with us. Joe, what is the owl uh, population like in Mississippi? Do we have a lot of different kinds of owls here in our state? We have three that breed in the state uh, that immediately come to mind. Probably the most common one is the barred owl, B-A-R-R-E-D, uh, that's the one that uh, who, he says, who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. Some, my father referred to it as a swamp owl. It tends to occur in swampy areas, bottomlands, and so forth. And then there's the uh, great horned owl, which is a uh, fearsome predator. I don't have them in my immediate area, probably because I have the barred owls. Uh, if I had uh, great horned owls, I probably would not have the barred owls. Owls will prey on each other. Our smallest breeder is the screech owl, uh, and I don't encounter it that much, but but they are around. It takes a little effort to to uh, detect or to observe screech owls. They're small. They're not real loud. But once you get the hang of it, uh, I think they're probably pretty common. And I left out one breeder. I don't know how I could do that because they're behind my house. Uh, there's a hay field behind my house. The hay was cut this week, and the barn owls, B A R N, as opposed to barred, uh, come and hunt uh, when the hay has been cut. You know, the grass is short now. And I can hear them at night after the hay has been cut. They're looking for mice. So, I, you know, I can't uh, address the, whether or not the owls, whether we have healthy populations or not. I, I don't have, you know, the data in front of me. I hate to just speculate. But, the, but in my immediate area, I have barred and barn owls. I know where to go, not too far from here, and I can pick up screech owls. I used to do a an amphibian monitoring survey at night, and I would, in addition to the frogs, I would hear screech owls. And then I I don't have um, great horned owls in my immediate area, but once in a blue moon I find a one, a roadkill great horned owl. So they are around. I just miss them. They have a soft, you know, almost coo- it's almost like a dove, a soft cooing sound. Uh, so we do have owls, probably in pretty good shape. Or the populations are probably in pretty good shape, but I'm speculating there. All right, Rachel, good suggestion. We'll see if Libby can't uh, get to, to her vast network of connections and get someone to come talk about owls on the show in the next uh, coming weeks. Stay on the phone lines. Next, we are off to Pocahontas, Tennessee. Donna is on the line. Good morning, Donna. Go ahead. Good morning. I have a question. Um, about 20 years ago in Tishomingo County, Mississippi, the far northeast corner of the state, 
we had a pasture behind our home, and they had two very, very old giant oak trees. And there were two nights in a row that there looked like hundreds and hundreds of fireflies that lit that tree up, almost as if you bought fairy lights and just covered the entire tree with it. And it happened for two nights in a row, and then it didn't happen anymore. And I was wondering, what, what, does anybody have any idea about what might have caused that? Um, is there anything that could be done to ever have that happen again anywhere else? in another tree or something. It was just such uh, such an unusual but beautiful sight. It's not terribly uncommon, but you do have to catch the nights when they are most obvious. Um, if it was all around two trees, um, I guess I'd have to check if those were going to be synchronous fireflies, but up high in a tree, it's um, it's more likely to be um, different types of fireflies. But, yes, fireflies emerge kind of in waves when they do so that they can find each other. And so you do kind of tend to see a really nice display when you catch the right night. And it is perfectly common for them to only do it for a few nights. The synchronous fireflies that we've talked about on the radio show so much will uh, display for a couple of weeks, but if you don't catch, you know, if you caught the tail end, you would see the last two nights. So um, that's it's not an uncommon thing, but it is getting more and more rare as we have more, you know, bug spray and light pollution are the two things that will discourage them the most. So, yes. Keeping um, light levels low, you know, at least during the spring and summer will help in your yard. That helps uh, helps them find each other so they'll be more the next year. And um, what they're doing is the fireflies, as a, through their life cycle, they live most of their life in the leaf litter. So it's good to not disturb the surface of of the ground under those trees. If you leave that alone, that needs to be done pretty much year round. You need to just kind of leave that area. Don't uh, if you rake up all the leaves, then you're killing firefly larvae, which you know won't be there to emerge in the spring. So uh, take care of that habitat and keep the light levels low during. Uh, spring and summer, and there needs to be a little bit of moisture. They do like moisture, and then you can't spray bugs. If you spray bug spray in that area, they're real susceptible to that. Does that help? Is there a negative a downside to fireflies? Is there something about them that, that people do not like or... No, there's there's absolutely nothing. They don't they don't eat anything as larvae or as adults that that um are of interest to us. And they you know they don't carry any disease. They don't have any negative things. They're very poorly studied in science, in fact. And we all have said it's because they don't do any harm. And we usually study insects that do harm to people. Well, so thank you. it's more I of a citizen that. science kind of study. All right, Donna, thanks for your phone call. That's going to wrap things up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio, funding provided in part by listeners. To hear today's show or previous show, you can visit creaturecomforts.mpbonline.org. Our show is produced by Java Chapman. Our call screener this morning was Charles Arnold. For Libby Hartfield and our guest, Joe McGee, I'm Kevin Farrell. Stay tuned up next at 10. It's AutoCorrect. We'll be back next Thursday at 9 for another Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio.